almost daily when we listen to the news on the television or in some way or the other. In public life, we see people being charged with various crimes. And when you look into the Bible, you will find that from the Old and New Testaments that at times godly people were charged with things of which they were not guilty. And that was true of the Lord's church. And this morning I would like for us to consider certain charges, not all of them, but certain ones that are made against the Lord's church that are simply not true. I would like to begin on the basis of what I just said, that back over there in the Old Testament, you have a number of people who were influenced by the wrong things, thus they made wrong decisions. You'll remember that when the 12 spies were picked by Moses, they were sent into the land of promise early on after they left Egypt. And they spied out the land. Caleb and Joshua came back saying, We're, we can take it. But 10 of the spies, without faith as they ought to have had, declared plainly that we can't do it. There are giants in the land. We were as grasshoppers in their side and so they didn't and they were punished for it by 40 years of wilderness wandering so that those 20 years old and upward save Joshua and Caleb died in the wilderness but it's interesting to note that the people themselves believed the 10 spies rather than Joshua and Caleb and if you read Numbers chapter 14 their opposition to going up and possessing the land was so strong that the scripture says that all the congregation wanted to stone those two men. And it shows you how fickle, and that would characterize Israel down through the many years they existed, that those people were. When you look then later at Elijah, the great fearless, faithful prophet, you can see that he was very much in the minority when it came to King Ahab and Jezebel. Ahab just plainly came out and said that you're the one that's troubling Israel. He did that because Elijah told Ahab the truth and Ahab didn't like it. And Elijah turned around and replied to Ahab by saying, I have not troubled Israel. But thou and thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandment of the Lord. 1 Kings 18, 18. That begins to tell us why a great many people falsely charge the church and sometimes individual Christians in their own personal conduct. When you come down to the New Testament, the forerunner of the Christ was fearless in his proclamation and he preached in the spirit of Elijah. And because John the baptizer, the immerser, stood for what was right and opposed what was wrong, he was himself branded a troublemaker by the wife of Herod. And through her manipulations and the stupidity of her husband and vanity, she ended up getting John beheaded for preaching that they were in a lawful marriage. It is not lawful for thee, Herod, to have her, he said, Mark 6, 18 and 27. Then our Lord himself, God in the flesh, very man and very God, is taught plainly in which we all believe to be the light of the world. And yet what was the reaction of many people, and I mean now the Jews, who should have recognized him for who he was. What was their reaction to him? Well, John says in John 3 in verse 19, Jesus, of course, speaking, John records it. Light is coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. When people do wrong, when they violate the truth, they don't like to have it pointed out to them that they are in the wrong. 
And later, the peerless apostle Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, was to show that in his work to spread the gospel, that that disposition of mind still prevailed. Even in the Lord's church, he wrote to the churches of Galatia in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 16, asking his own brethren, Am I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? And sadly, though that's a rhetorical question, the actual answer to that is regarding some brethren is yes. You are our enemy because you do point out sins in our lives and we don't like that. And that's putting it mildly. I remember back a long time ago as a young man, I preached on some material I was Awakened one morning with the phone ringing, and this elderly lady let me know, and these are her words, I told you I could be mean, and you're about to find out about it, <laughs> quote, unquote. Now, I can quote that because <laughs> imagine a person old enough to be my grandmother claiming to be a member of the church, and yet because the truth had been preached and it hit her pretty hard, that was her attitude. How she justified herself and saying, I know I'm mean, and I told you I could be, and now you're going to find out about it. Well, I suggest that uh, when you read about these bad people in the Bible, they haven't disappeared. Well, throughout man's history, when some will stand up for what is revealed by God concerning what is right, and the emphasis is placed on the right as God defines what is right, there will be those who will oppose and they will mock and they will ridicule, attack, actually persecuting those who taught the truth and lived it. That was certainly true when the Lord established the church, as Luke records in Acts chapter 2. And as I say again, for emphasis, it's still true today. And I don't know any preachers who have lived the Christian life personally in their families and have preached the whole counsel of God that have not experienced that from time to time, from members of the church. When I read through all the perils that Paul lists, every time I get to where he says, in perils of false brethren, I identify with that one more than I do any of the other perils that he lists, because I've experienced that on numerous occasions. Things haven't changed then. At least they haven't changed much as far as people and their dispositions are concerned. There'll still be people who will love the truth, but in contrast to the many who don't, they are few and far between, and the Bible tells us, tells us to expect that. And certainly that's true even in the Lord's church. And sadly, that's the case. So these, uh, the charges that are made then against the church can still be heard. And I say again, as I said a moment ago, I don't intend to cover a lot of them, but some basic ones. So I'd like for us to, to look at some of them. One of them, and the first one we'll examine, is that you people teach the church of Christ that you can violate the law of God. I suppose that's a, a ploy that's been used a lot among the enemies of Christ, among those who want to justify denominationalism and denominational worship and denominational churches and so on. But when Paul and Silas were preaching Christ in the city of Philippi in Macedonia, there were those in that city who saw them as a threat to their own welfare. And they didn't mind doing what they thought would bring the hardest response to Paul and his preaching friends and brethren. You see, Philippi was a Roman colony. It had special privileges and was conducted in a way that was different from a lot of places because being a Roman colony pretty much said we're making a place here just like the imperial city of Rome and things will be done here and allowed here and uh, conducted here like it's done there. So immediately, if you'll go back and read Acts 16, you'll see 
that they went straight to the government and they brought indictment or charges against Paul because of their violation of Roman law. Listen, these men, they said, speaking of Paul, notice, being Jews, they don't just trouble our city, but they said do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, and then he says why, being Romans. Now this was a very hasty effort on their part. For you'll remember if you go through all of Acts 16, that if they'd done their homework properly, they would have found out Paul was a Roman citizen. And I promise you, a great many of those people weren't because it was a prized position. And Paul tells us later that he was freeborn. Now that charge, of course, was not true whether Paul was a citizen or not. But it served their purpose. They sought to stir up the people, get them emotionally involved, and that would do it in a Roman colony if you said, we're not living like Roman law says we ought to live. Thus, their preaching overall was rejected. And notice, not necessarily because they believed the teaching was wrong. Certainly it wasn't. It was God's truth. It was the gospel, God's power to save men, Romans 1.16. But it was because people were prejudiced against it on the basis of the false charges. This has long been a ploy in places, and if you talk to people and missionaries and others, you'll see that those folks who don't understand anything about New Testament Christianity, who are settled into a human church, a denomination, well, they want to shut you up any way they can. When Russia was first opened and after communism fell and people went into Russia, you remember there was the Eastern Orthodox Church. And when the Tsar was still ruling up through World War I, it was a state church. It was the Church of Russia known as Eastern Orthodox, but primarily Russian Orthodox. And they worked hand in hand with the Tsar to rule the whole thing. Well, guess what? Russia opens up, at least as it was 20 years or more ago. People start coming in who are not Russian Orthodox. What do the Russian Orthodox do? Well, in one particular assembly, a priest stood up and said, Christians are already here. They've been here a long time. What are you doing here? Well, of course, in my judgment, that just affords an opportunity to explain the difference in a human denominational group and in what true, pure New Testament Christianity is. But nevertheless, the mindset is based upon error. And some honest people, because that's all they know, can actually espouse false things that hurt the church and cause people to have a view. We've often heard people say, you people in the Church of Christ don't believe in the Old Testament. Well, if they understood really what we taught, they'd know better than that. All that we've ever done is point out that we're under authority of Christ in the words of the New Testament. Why? Because Matthew 28, 18, the inspired Matthew, the apostle, recorded Jesus saying all, that's all inclusive, all power or authority hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth. And then we quote such passages as Colossians 3, 17, whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by him. So we don't go back and follow the law of Moses or anything pertaining to the patriarchy. We submit to the doctrine of Christ. Does that mean that the Old Testament is rejected as the inspired word of God? Not at all. Does it mean that we're simply saying you must rightly divide or handle correctly the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15, as we study it? It certainly does. 
And I can go back and read and memorize, if such were possible, even in Hebrew, everything Moses said. Moses and the prophets. And I could still ask, what must I do to be saved by Jesus Christ? And if that's all I'm going on, I'll never learn the answer. Because what must we do to be saved by Christ from our sins is not answered in the law and the prophets. And thus I must understand that those things under the Old Testament were written aforetime for our learning. Those under the authority of Christ in the New Testament for their learning. That we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, might have hope. There are many marvelous things taught in the Old Testament that equip us better to serve Christ under the perfect law of liberty, the New Testament, James 1 and verse 25. Here's a good example. The matter of specifics and generics. When God decided to destroy the world in Noah's day by water, we find that he commanded Noah to build an ark of gopher wood. God commanded it. He commanded Noah to build an ark out of what? Gopher wood. He didn't say pine. He didn't say sycamore or any other kind of wood that might have existed at that time. He listened, specified gopher wood. Now, we may not fully understand what gopher wood was at that time as we live today but he did and he knew the definition of gopher wood and anything that did not fit the definition of gopher wood he was not authorized to use now that principle follows all the way through the Old Testament they were in the patriarchal age but then it follows through under the law of Moses and it follows in the New Testament there's a difference in generics and specifics. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Generally, we're to go how we go is not specified. Where we go, to all the world. Where we go first, for us today, is certainly not specified. But it is specified that it is the gospel that is to be preached. And thus, I must define the gospel according to the New Testament to know what's to be preached and why it's to be preached. So the law of generics and specifics start way back there and is true of any language that communicates the mind of someone to someone else. It's a part of the communicative element of language. Now Jesus stated, my kingdom is not of this world. John 18 verse 36. If those people in Philippi had understood as they ought, correctly about the kingdom of Christ that Paul preached, they would have known that he was not preaching something to take the place of the earthly empire, the kingdom of the Romans. Jesus is saying that his kingdom is a spiritual kingdom, that his kingdom is wherever men on this earth believe in him and obey him, that kingdom exists. It's not a political outfit. I get the idea sometimes in America that some people get the idea that, well, if we just get the right political party, everything's going to be perfect in America. Well, it might be better. <laughs> it might be worse. But it will not satisfy what the gospel and the kingdom of Christ can only satisfy and got many to satisfy. Or else Christ would have never said, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and unto God the things that are of God. So some still expect him today among religious people, Christ that is, to come and establish his kingdom on this earth. They don't recognize the church is the kingdom and the kingdom is the church. The two terms are used interchangeably when Christ promised to build his church in Matthew 16. That when you read Colossians 1, you'll see that Paul talks about how they've been translated in the kingdom of God's dear son. That's almost 2,000 years ago. And Paul and the Galatians were in the kingdom then. Well, you can't say then it's yet to come. I mean, everybody today was not in it, and they weren't either. But the Bible says the word, which you're going to believe. So the nature of the kingdom 
is spiritual. And Christ rules as King of kings and Lord of lords by his authoritative perfect law of liberty, the Word of God, the New Testament in specifics. And we are what we ought to be before God because we receive his teaching and then from the heart we obey it. So these people who teach, and they really do when things get lively as they are over in the Middle East, begin to try to see signs and times. I listened last week to a fellow that is very capable, far above most people, in the area of apologetics, proving the existence of God, the deity of Christ. A lot to offer there. Not all is good. But when he comes right down to the kingdom, he doesn't understand it from an old shoe. He falls right back into the problem of the signs of the times. And he goes to Matthew 24 where the Lord's talking about the signs preceding the destruction of Jerusalem and tries to apply them to the end of time when the Lord returns. Well, it's a shame that a person can know more, far more than a lot of people concerning the proofs of the existence of God and the deity of Christ and the plenary verbal inspiration of the scriptures and then what does he do with it? Of what good is it? It's a necessary thing to believe that God exists, that Christ is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, and the Bible is the Word of God, and you must study it and do it. But then you don't even know the plan of salvation, and you don't believe it. You don't know how to determine it. You don't even understand the nature of the kingdom. But that's where we are today. And so because of that kind of ignorance, People will make charges against the church as we've been noting them. We come on down to another that's important. And I've already touched on it, but I want to emphasize it. And that is we don't believe the Old Testament. Now the other I've emphasized is you don't believe in law. As an addendum to that before I leave it, there are people who will say if you're saved by God's favor, then you can't be under law. That fails to realize that it's God's favor that we don't deserve and cannot earn or merit. That God's favor is extended to man through the words of the perfect law of liberty. What they don't understand is that we're not saved by a pure law system. Now, Paul said, Concerning the law of Moses, if righteousness could come by the law, then that would have done it. Which means you could not do that as a law system. If one could save you, that one would. But we must understand that because a system is a system of faith, it doesn't rule out law altogether. And thus, the salvation that's free... And by God's favor, offering that favor to God to a man to save him. Man can't earn it. He doesn't deserve it. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. But yet man's a free moral agent. He can be persuaded by the truth. He's expected to be persuaded by the truth. John 8, 31 and 32. And thus he can will to obey God or not. Now we've already established back over in the book of Genesis, Genesis 6 that it was Noah who was commanded to build the ark. He had to keep that commandment. But preceding that in verse 8 of chapter 6, it says, Noah found favor in God's sight. Why, he was saved by the grace of God, wasn't he? But in verse 22, it says, Thus did God according to all that God commanded, thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. There's grace and obedience. Grace on God's part. Grace offered him the plan. Noah understood it and kept the plan and obeyed it. And he was saved by God's grace as much as he was saved by anything. People don't understand that, but there it is. Right back there in the book of origins. There's the origins of salvation by grace through an obedient faith. And it never changes all the way down through Mosaical law and Christ. But now, back from that, to the matter of saying you people don't believe the Old Testament. Let me add to what I said earlier. We read in Acts 18 and verse 13. 
that the Jews actually made that same basic charge against the Apostle Paul. Listen to how they did it. Speaking of Paul, they said, This fellow persuadeth men to worship God contrary to the law. Well, of course, we talk about that usually and use the terms Old Testament to refer to it. But the Scripture calls the Old Testament, Hebrews 8, 13, that which had to do with revealing the necessity of something else besides the law, that if men were to know salvation, and you see in Ephesians 3 and verse 11 that in the eternal purpose of God, back in the mind of God from our standpoint as a human being, in eternity past, it says that he purposed to save men by Christ Jesus, Ephesians 3, 11. Well, then what was the purpose of the law of Moses in the Old Testament, as we say? It was to make man fully aware of sin by writing it down, codifying it. Romans 3 and verse 20. And in so doing, it would also make people or prepare people for the coming Savior. So he wrote to the Galatians in Galatians 3, 24 and 25. Moreover, it foreshadowed in type many aspects of the New Testament. That's one of the great values of the book of Hebrews is to see that. Hebrews 10 and verse number 1. But what people fail to realize, they say, well, all you have to do is keep the Ten Commandments, which nobody today could keep all the Ten Commandments. They wanted to. They can't do it. But I find in reading where Moses restates the law just before the children of Israel to be led by Joshua to go into the land of Canaan, in Deuteronomy 5, verses 1 through 5, Moses says to Israel, this law was given to us, not to our fathers, but to us, even us who are all alive here this day. You know, there just never was a time the Jews were taught, go into all the world, preach the, preach the law of Moses to every creature. This wasn't there. Could uh, Gentiles decide that they wanted to take upon themselves the keeping of the law? Yes, they could become proselytes. But notice Hebrews 8 and verse 7. If that first covenant was found, was uh, uh, I'll read it again. If that first covenant was found faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. What does that say to you? There was a need for a second one because the first one wasn't sufficient in itself to do the job. In Hebrews nine fifteen. We learn that he's the mediator, Christ, of a New Testament. In Hebrews 10, 9, he taketh away the first that he may establish the second. I don't know what people get out of that who try to say that you can just go back to the Old Testament, live by that, especially the Ten Commandments. Most of them pick and choose under the Old Testament what they want to keep and what they don't. But you know, if you're going to be under the law of Moses, you don't just pick some of it. You have to keep all of it. Paul even reasoned that way with Galatian churches when he was refuting the Judaizing teachers who said to the Gentiles, you can be saved by Christ, but you must be circumcised to keep the law. Paul says if you're, if you're going to do that, you have to keep all of it, not just some of it as it suits you. So he says in Galatians 5, 2 and 3, if you receive circumcision then Christ is not going to profit you anything. For I testify to every man that's circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. But the law was fulfilled for the purpose that God gave it. So Christ, according to Paul in Colossians 2.14, took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Thus today, under the authority of Christ, we live by the New Testament, not the Old Testament. And ours is, as I said already, the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25. It is not the handwriting of ordinances or the bond of ordinances which was against us that was taken out of the way when it was nailed to the cross. 
Now another one would say, well, you people are just another denomination, and you're saying your denomination is better than the other denominations. Well, if there's a member of the church saying that, they're just as wrong as they could be. They need some education themselves that the Lord's church is not, has not been, and will not be a denomination. One of the curses of denominationalism that those who accept it seem to be dedicated rabidly, I guess, in their efforts to force everybody into a denomination and they don't have any idea whatsoever and they're not going to let it stand that you could be a Christian without being a part of any denomination. And I would go further than that and say the only way you're going to heaven is to be a Christian and not be a part of any denomination, just a member of the church that Jesus built. Now, if you go back over 1,900 years ago, almost 2,000, you look at the Jews, and they were divided into different sects. And denominations are like that today. Now, while you'll remember Paul was in prison in Rome, Jews came to hear him. In Acts 28, verse 22, they said, To hear of thee what thou thinkest. For concerning this sect, we know that everywhere it's spoken against. Now, that's not what Paul called the church. That's what they called the church. That's how they had heard it referred to. Now, notice when Paul, before that time, had appeared before the Jewish council in Acts 24, 14. He says, this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call a sect, so serve I the God of our fathers. Others, Jews in particular, called it a sect. Paul didn't call the Lord's church a sect. He was right. And faithful Christians as there appeared in the New Testament didn't call it that. And those today won't, and none until the end of time, however long that is, won't call the Lord's church a sect. Now, Jesus prayed, you'll remember, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they all may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou sent me. John 17, 21, one of the greatest hindrances to the cause of Christ is denominationalism. You can talk about secularism. You can about talk about all sorts of other philosophies. But denomination says to the denomination says to the world, we don't care what pre, what Christ prayed in John 17. Denominationalism is the very opposite of what Christ prayed for. And we're plainly told by the inspired apostle Paul that there is one body, Ephesians 4 and verse 4. And we learn from the same book, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, that that one body is the church. He repeats himself again to say the same thing, Colossians 1 and verse 18. I think the Lord's command is clear. His command given through the Holy Spirit through the pen of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 1.10, let there be no divisions among you, but you be of the same mind and the same judgment. And yet the denominations ignore those things. They really don't believe they can take place. They deny the truth of these words. You know, if there's nothing else about them, that would be enough for me to reject them. They give lip service to the Bible. If you were to ask them, do you believe that to be the word of God? Most of them would say yes. But if you pull up John chapter 17, verse 21, and 1 Corinthians 1, 10, and read that, or Ephesians 4, and verse 4, or Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, they'll try to explain away what it plainly says. That language is easy to understand. They simply don't believe it. As we studied earlier, men love darkness rather than light. 
So when some would divide the Lord's church into various factions or denominations or different religious groups believing and teaching different things and contradictory things, then we would, with Paul, ask, is Christ divided? 1 Corinthians 1, 13, that's a rhetorical question. Well, no, he's not. The Lord's church is not. If there's error in the church, it's because of what error is, false teaching. And men have substituted the truth to embrace and keep the error. I don't know why we're so surprised about that, but almost all of the New Testament, even in the works of Christ on earth in his earthly ministry, he warns us about all that. So denominationalism was not acceptable to the Lord in Corinth as it appeared there. And it's not acceptable to the faithful child of God today. And that faithful child of God is a member of the church of Jesus Christ, which is not a denomination. Then the last one. You won't fellowship us, denominations saying that. You won't join with our religious community. I moved one place one time, and one of the members asked me if I would be a member of a member of the church. Asked me if I'd be a member of the ministerial alliance. You know, I was quite young then, and I was just so naive. I'll, I'll be nice to myself and say naive. I didn't have any better sense when I started preaching but to think that every single solitary member of the Church of Christ knew what the Lord's Church was and understood what a Christian was as the Bible defines and uses that term. In my first full-time work, I had to come to grips with the fact there are people in the Lord's Church who don't know the Lord's Church from what can I compare it to. I had to adjust my thoughts as a preacher of the gospel to realize members of the church need the truth, the fundamentals, the first principles as much as about anybody else does. Why they consider themselves members of the church, what they, th I don't know how they got to where they were, but there they were. You'd think that a person would know a faithful member of the church, a Christian, cannot fellowship false doctrine and false teachers wherever it is. Certainly not the denominations. But I found myself having to explain to that person why I couldn't be a part of such a thing as that. I don't know exactly how he felt, but one of the passages that he had to understand, and he had to hear some preaching on it in the weeks to come from that time forward, neither is the salvation any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That is a must to know, Hebrews 4 and verse 12. That's why Jesus said, John 14, 6, that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Well, people in those days didn't like that idea either. Well, many of them still don't. While I sought to have further discussion, I shut down a number of discussions hardly before they got started among certain people when they try to be so magnanimous and try to include everybody that says the Bible's the Bible and God's God and Jesus is the Christ and without further agreement on things obligatory in the New Testament. And I'd simply say, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then talk about the way, what's that mean? The truth, what does that mean? And the life. And then they emphasize no man comes to the Father but by Jesus. And what does that mean? And how does that work? Well, there's a sermon in there you could preach for years. So, the only way to heaven is through Christ. The only way to heaven through Christ is through His will. And the only way to heaven through Christ by His will is what He teaches. And I know what He said about the church. I know that those who obeyed the gospel on that first Pentecost when the church was established was by the Lord himself when they were baptized for the remission of sins and spent the believers added to his church that he purchased with his blood. Acts 2, 38 and 47 and Acts 20 and verse 28. Well, people got upset over that back then. They haven't changed. If they love darkness, that which is contrary to the light of truth of the gospel, and they're not going to like 
those things. Now, you can smile at them and be friends to them and be as humble and nice as you want to, but you never surrender the plain truth of the Bible. Jesus told the apostles, if the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own, John 15, 18 through 19. And what does that tell you about why the church begins to slip slide away as it's been slip sliding away over the past several years? If the church of the Lord would conform to the world, then peace as the world defines it would be possible. Some have chosen to do that, but I don't. And I resolved a long time ago, well, if it comes down to just me, it'll just have to be me. If it comes down to just me and my house, and here's how it's going to be. I can worship scripturally in my living room with anybody else in the whole Harris County is with me or not. And thus, that's the way it has to be if you're going to abide in the truth under any and all circumstances and never compromise if it comes to that. In 1 John 5, 19, as we've studied, or we haven't got to it yet on Wednesday night, but John simply says the whole world lieth under the evil one or in wickedness. Well, I have to believe that as a member of the church, or why should I be preaching the gospel to the whole world? Try to get them out of it. The message is still repent or perish, Luke 13, 3. If people worship wrongly or they worship the wrong God, they must change. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it, Acts 17, 22, and 23. If they have the wrong faith, then they must change their faith to that of the New Testament, Jude 3. If they are part of a church established and sustained by the commandments and doctrines of men, they must give it up. They must turn from it. And they must assemble and work and serve and worship with those who have loved the truth, sacrificed to obey it, and they won't turn from it. The Lord's church. It doesn't make any difference what government or religious leaders say. It doesn't change the words of truth. And then I want to close simply on this. Jesus said, through the Spirit, by the pen of the Apostle Paul, come ye out from among them and be ye separate and touch not the unclean thing. That principle's still true. You'll never be what God wants you to be if you don't follow that viewpoint. And so it is that if we remain the church, as you read of it on the pages of your own New Testament, it'll be because of our dedication to the truth that we can meet these false charges that people bring against us. Not only these, but any others. If you need to obey the gospel, we studied this morning what it takes to become a Christian. And more than that, he doesn't require of you. Less than that, and you'll remain lost in your sins. As a child of God, have you sinned? If so, you need to repent of it. Confess those sins and pray God for forgiveness. Thus, if you're subject to the invitation of our Lord, we once again offer you this opportunity to obey Him while we stand and while we sing.